In this lecture, you'll learn about how spanning tree works. This is going to be a bit of a longer lecture because there is a fair bit to spanning tree and there's not really any logical points where I can break this into separate videos. So this is a good time to go and grab yourself a coffee and then come back and settle into the video. Okay, so how spanning tree works. It's an industry standard protocol which is enabled by default on all vendors' switches. You've already seen how devastating a broadcast storm can be on a local area network. We need to avoid that at all costs, and spanning tree is how we do it, so it's always enabled on all vendor switches when they come out of the box. Switches send BPDUs, Bridge Protocol Data Units, when they come online. And the BPDUs are used to detect other switches and potential loops. The switch will not forward traffic out any port until it's certain that that port is loop free. When the first when the port first comes online, it will be in a blocking state because the switch needs to make sure it doesn't send traffic until it's sure there's not a loop there. Spanning tree will detect if the port forms a potential loop. And if there's no loop, the port will then transition to a forwarding state. But that process can take up to 50 seconds if you're using traditional legacy spanning tree. The BPTU contains the switch's bridge ID, which uniquely identifies the switch on the LAN. And the bridge ID is comprised of the switch's unique MAC address and also an administrator-defined bridge priority value. The bridge priority can be from 0 to 65535, and 32768 is the default. So switches, they're always going to have a MAC address on them. That's there out of the box. The bridge priority can be set by you, the administrator. But if you don't set that, it's going to default to 32768. Next thing we have is the root bridge. A root bridge, a single root bridge, is elected based on the switch's bridge ID values. The switch with the lowest bridge priority value in the LAN is preferred to be the root bridge. So if the bridge priority value is 16384, for example, that would be more preferred than 49152 because it's a lower number. In the case of a tie, the switch with the lowest MAC address will be selected. So going back a slide, if you don't manually manipulate this by manually setting a bridge ID, all the switches in your LAN will have the same bridge priority, which will be 32768. In that case, they'll all have a tie, so it will be the one with the lowest MAC address that will be selected as the root bridge. The switches build a loop-free forwarding path tree which leads back to the root bridge. And you'll see how this works as we go through this lecture. So a spanning tree example. In our example here, we've not manually set bridge priority on any of our switches. We've got four switches here, CD1, the CD is for core distribution, CD2, and we've got access layer 3 and access 4. CD1 has got MAC address 1.1.1. It's actually 1.1.1.1.1.1.1.1. But to make it a bit shorthand, I've said it's MAC 1.1.1. CD2 is MAC 2.2.2, AXIS 3 is MAC 3.3.3, .3, and AXIS 4 is MAC 4.4.4. .4. Because I haven't set a bridge priority on any of the switches, CD1 will be elected as the root bridge because it has got the numerically lowest MAC address. The other switches will then detect their lowest cost path to get to the root bridge, and those paths will transition to a forwarding state. For the cost, when a switch calculates its best path towards the root bridge, higher bandwidth links are preferred. So a gigabit Ethernet interface would be preferred over a lower bandwidth fast Ethernet interface, for example. 
Each switch's exit interface on the lowest cost path towards the root bridge is selected as its root port. So if you have a look at the diagram here, we already said that CD1 is the root bridge. From CD2's point of view, it's got two paths. It can actually it's got three paths it can take to get to CD1. It can go out interface gigabit zero slash two. It's directly connected to CD1. Or it could go via axis four by going out fast zero slash twenty-four and then out fast zero slash twenty-one on axis four. Or it could go via axis three, so it would go out port fast zero slash twenty-one on CD two, and then out port fast zero slash twenty-four on axis three. Hopefully, it's really obvious which is going to be the lowest cost path out of those three. It's going to be the direct connection along the top on the gigabit zero slash two interface. So on CD2, interface gig zero slash two will be selected as its root port. Next up, we have access three. Access three could get to the root bridge CD1 either out interface fast zero slash twenty four directly, or it could go out interface fast zero slash twenty one to CD2 and then across on interface gig zero slash two. Again, it should be obvious that a single fast Ethernet link is going to be a lower cost than a gigabit Ethernet plus a fast Ethernet link. So, Axis three will select port fast zero slash twenty four as its lowest cost to get to CD one, and that interface becomes its root port. And then finally, we have Axis four, and it should be obvious again which will be the root port on Axis four. It's going to be interface fast zero slash twenty one, which again is directly connected to the root bridge of CD one. While I'm going through this, by the way, this is how the spanning tree operations work as well. The first thing that happens is a root bridge is elected. So all the switches come online. They send BBTUs to each other over the LAN. They all detect each other, and whichever bridge has got the best bridge ID, so the lowest priority. If there's a tie, it will be the lowest MAC address. Becomes the root bridge. That's the first thing that happens. The next thing that happens is that all the switches in the LAN will figure out which is their root port, the best port to get towards the root bridge, and we'll carry on going through the operations through the rest of this lecture. Now, importantly, spanning tree does not do load balancing. If a switch has multiple equal cost paths towards the root bridge, it will select the neighbor switch with the lowest bridge ID, and that is going to be just one path. So you see in the example diagram here, core one is the root bridge now. And looking at it from axis three down at the bottom's point of view, it's got two equal cost paths it could take to get to the root bridge core one. It could either go out interface fast zero slash twenty four on the left hand side, or interface fast zero slash twenty three on the right hand side. Now, spanning tree, it's not a dynamic routing protocol. If this was a routing protocol, it would do equal cost load balancing, and traffic would go up both paths. But with spanning Spanning tree, it doesn't do load balancing. It selects the one best path. So what happens here is Axis three selects the path to the core one root bridge via distribution two, as it has a lower bridge ID. Whenever there's a tie. The switch will select the neighbor switch with the lowest bridge ID, and that is distribution two in this case because it's got a lower MAC address than distribution one does. And we didn't set priority on either of them for this example. Another example of load balancing. So if I go back a slide here, we had two equal cost paths towards the root bridge going through two different switches. In this next example, again, spanning tree does not do load balancing. If a switch has multiple equal cost paths via the same neighbor switch towards the root bridge, 
Again, it will only select one of those paths. It will select the port with the lowest port ID. So the example here, we've actually got four uplinks towards the root bridge core one from Axis 3. We've got two going towards distribution one and two going towards distribution two. Out of those four uplinks, only one of them is going to be selected. Axis 3 will select the path to the core one root bridge via distribution two, port fast zero slash one is it is the port with the lowest port id which is going to the switch with the lowest bridge id okay moving on so first thing we select which is the root bridge next up all of the other switches select their root port towards the root bridge next thing is designated ports ports on the neighbor switch opposite the root port are designated ports so your root ports point towards the root bridge, designated ports point away from it. And all ports in the root bridge will always be designated ports because obviously they are going to be pointing away from the root bridge when they're on it. So in the example here, we already discovered which were our root ports on the interface on the other side of those links, they will be set as designated ports. So looking at CD2, its root port was gig 0 slash 2 along the top. The interface on the other side, which is gig 0 slash 2 on CD1, will be set as a designated port. The next one is facing access free. Access free's root port was fast 0 slash 24. The interface on the other side of that link is fast 0 slash 24 on CD1. And finally, it should be obvious that access 4, its root port is fast 0 slash 21. So the designated port will be on the other side of that link. It's going to be on fast 0 slash 21 on CD1. And you can see here that all the ports in the root bridge are all Always designated ports. Now, looking at that previous example, you're maybe thinking, well, it's obvious which are the designated ports, it's just all the ports that are on the root bridge. But that's not necessarily the case, because if you see here, I'm going to add another switch into the network, which is the not directly connected to the root bridge. It's connected to CD2. If you look at that switch, it should be pretty obvious that its root port is going to be on the interface facing CD2. And then the designated port will be the port on CD2, which is facing back towards that root port. So whenever we've got a root port, the interface on the other side of the link is going to be a designated port. Your root ports and your designated ports are the most direct paths to and from the root bridge. And the root bridge serves as a central point of the networking for where our traffic flows are going to go to and from. So because your root ports and designated ports are on the most direct path, they are always going to transition to a forwarding state. On the remaining links, the switches determine which of them has the least cost path to the root. If they have equal cost paths, then the bridge ID is used as a tiebreaker. And the port connecting this switch to the link is selected as a designated port. So looking at our diagram again here, you see that we've got two links left over which have not been configured with root and designated ports. That's the link from interface fast 0 slash 21 on axis 3 to fast 0 slash 21 on CD2. And the other link is on axis 4 port fast 0 slash 24 going up to fast 0 slash 24 on CD2. On those two remaining links, they're links that would form a loop. So we're going to need to block. And we're going to block on one side of the link. The other side of the link will remain a designated port. So right now we need to figure out which side will be the blocking side, which will be the designated port side. The side which has got the switch with the least cost path to the route or the lowest bridge ID will be the designated port side. The other side will be the blocking part. So 
right now CD2 has got a gigabit ethernet direct link going to the root bridge of CD2. That's going to be lower cost than Axis 3 and Axis 4 which have got fast ethernet links. So CD2 is going to be the preferred switch so it's going to have designated ports on each side of those links. So from Axis 3 fast 0 slash 21 to CD2 fast 0 slash 21, the CD2 side is going to be the designated port. And it's also going to be the CD2 side, which is the designated port, going on the link on fast 0 slash 24 down to Axis 4. Any ports which have not been selected as a root port or a designated port pair would potentially form a loop. And those are going to be selected as our blocking ports. So you can see on the diagram right now, we've only got two ports left over. That's fast 0 slash 21 on axis 3 and fast 0 slash 24 on axis 4. If those ports were also forwarding, we would be forwarding everywhere and we would have a loop. So we're going to block on those parts to break the loops. So we block on fast 0 slash 24 on axis 4 and on fast 0 slash 21 on axis 3. And you can now see that I've completed my diagram. Every single part has been labeled as either a root part, a designated part or a blocking part. Spanning tree only blocks ports on one side of the blocked link. BBTUs continue to be sent over the link, but other traffic is dropped. So we continue to send BBTUs so that spanning tree can detect if any links go down and fail around to a different path around that. Okay, so we covered how to figure out the route, the designated and the blocking ports. I'll summarize here about the quick and easy way to do that, which really aligns with how Spanning Tree actually works as well. So first off, determine which is the root bridge out of all the switches. That will be the switch which has got the best bridge ID. Next, all ports on the root bridge are designated ports. So if you've drawn this as a diagram, on your diagram, on all the ports that are on the root bridge, you can mark them as DP, designated ports. Next, determine the root ports on the other switches, the non-root bridges. The root port will be the port which has got the lowest cost to the root bridge. Mark those as RP, root ports on your diagram. Next up, the ports on the other side of those links, on the other side of your root ports, are going to be designated ports, so you can mark them off. And then on the links which are left over, one port will be blocking, the other side will be a designated port. Determine which is the blocking port, that's the one which has got the highest cost path to the root bridge or the highest bridge ID. The ports on the other side of those links are designated ports, you've now completed your diagram, you know all the ports in the network, what type they are. So going back to our original diagram, showing the entire network here, and if you look back at the previous slides with the diagrams, this was just a zoomed in, drill down level of the switches. So going back, this diagram here, I've zoomed back out again to show the entire network. So those are the available paths through the network. If you look at the switching part here, you can see I've removed the links which were blocked. All unicast, multicast and broadcast traffic, so all the traffic on the network can only go over those links. If you look up at the top part of the network, you see that there are loops between our routers. But routing protocol loop prevention mechanisms and the TTL field in our IP header prevent traffic from actually looping at layer three. Looking at the switched part of the network, you see that there are no actual loops there now. They've all been removed by spanning tree. So spanning tree, in, spanning tree ensures that there are no loops at layer two. 
And if we go back to the ARP request that we covered at the start of this section, where PC1 sent out an ARP request for its default gateway at R1, you can see that now we are using spanning tree, the traffic still gets flooded everywhere over the tree, but it doesn't get looped anywhere. So traffic still needs to, can still get where it needs to go, but we're not gonna have any broadcast storms formed by loops. If an uplink to CD1 fails, spanning tree will detect it and transition the redundant link to forwarding. So you can see in the example here that my uplink from axis 3 to CD1 and my uplink from axis 4 to the root bridge at CD1, both of those failed. If that happens, then spanning tree will detect it and it will fail it over to the next best path, still ensuring that there are no loops. So this is what our topology would look like if we had lost those uplinks to CD1. You can now see that we still have just that one spanning tree again with no loops in it. Now the traffic is going via CD2. Okay, we got there. That's it. You now know the whole thing about how spanning tree works. In the next few lectures, we'll get into how to actually monitor and configure it. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with Cisco Networks for free, then you can download my 400-page CCNA lab guide, which you can see above my head right now. Also, check out the video about my CCNA course. It's the highest-rated course online. Thanks.